Took me a while, but here we are with another one. In the previous project, we talked a bit more about decision-making related to chemistry used in restoration. It came somewhat naturally due to the complexity of the cleaning process of that specific panel painting, and also because some of you liked the technical aspect to my videos, which you kindly let me know through the comments. And I have to say, a majority of them was extremely motivating for me, so huge thanks for that. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that the idea of focusing on one specific aspect in every new video instead of just repetitively showing the step-by-step -step restoration without going deeper seemed like a more enjoyable thing to do. As per custom, first let's take a quick look at the pre-restoration photo documentation. This portrait painting will be the today's talk. Without further ado, let's get to it. And we are starting quick today. I had already done the solubility tests to have the most optimal cleaning method. What you can see in these close-ups is a combination of mechanical and chemical removal of degraded varnish with dirt, gelled emulsion solvent applied and left to do its magic for a few short moments, upon which a constant switching between a scalpel and a cotton swab dipped in solvent finished the job. I usually try to work area by area as different pigments might react slightly differently. Like this whitish color, that's the most resistant and safe area due to the high percentage of lead white used. So even on one painting, the solvent agent used or the time or number of applications may differ greatly. The most enjoyable parts to clean for me are bright areas like face, as the difference is most striking. But cleaning will not be the main focus this time around. I'll be trying to show the part of restoration that rarely anyone besides restorers notices. But before we dive any deeper, I know some of you guys enjoy cleaning process very much. So let me indulge you in a short but complete time lapse of this satisfactory activity. At this point it's 99% clean, but the residual 1% can sometimes take a comparably long time. First, it's the residual dirt in the structure of the impastos of the brush strokes, best visible in areas painted with brighter colors that mostly used a sizable proportion of lead white. The best way to address this is with dental tools. And yes, it's very time consuming as you have to do it locally. But by no means is it necessary to remove all of it. It's actually what is called the patina and it's an inherent aspect to old artwork, so making it evenly distributed is the goal. Overcleaning is often underestimated and may end up in an irreversible change to the artwork. That's why it's very important to do the cleaning process gradually with patience.
it's occasional unevenness of the old layers of varnish that appear as glossy spots. But here it's a combination of that and the heat activated consolidant I used from the back of the painting to secure the painting layer as its adhesion was compromised. It is easily removable with a solvent, so we do that to avoid gloss differences in final varnish. It is good practice to check the artwork under different angles and lighting so that we don't overlook anything. Now an extremely satisfying part, varnish isolation layer. Not only does it protect the painting during the filling in, it also shows the true colors of the painting during the retouching. The final varnish will be altered at the end of the work to accommodate the desired final look. And having finished the remaining 1%, we start with the filling in. It might seem as a relatively simple task, but this is actually where you determine how much of retouching will be necessary. And that's the point where we are slowly getting to what I mainly wanted to talk about. Notice the different size and depth of the holes or defects in the painting. They are definitely not the same. And whilst you absolutely must fill in most of them, some are better left untouched. I start with the most obvious ones. The most eye-catching parts, bright areas with heavy pastels and so on. Those are the parts where retouching color alone would not be able to hide the damage. Now you might be asking yourself, why? What makes the difference? Great question indeed. A short introduction to historical painting techniques will come in handy. And it has to do with what the painting is made of. Let's start with the first step, a stretcher. What you can see here is the most typical one you will see artists use today. It uses mitre joints and is expandable with keys that come into slots in the corners. They allow for adjustment of canvas tension. This was not possible with the old strainers that were rigid in corners, usually held together with nails or glue. The other difference is a spacer strip, which is this thing over here. And the purpose is to avoid the stretcher being indented through to the face of the painting, which in practice looks like this. The distinction between the two is best illustrated through these diagrams. First, a profile of a modern stretcher showing how the distancing works. And here, the more simple profile of a strainer which lacks the distancing, which in turn might create the aforementioned problem. But this feature of distancing can also be achieved with a slanted profile, which was also used in the past. The other very interesting type that they used in the past and you definitely won't see today is seen in this reproduction of a painting by Aerde Helder, which is a self-portrait as Zeuxis portraying an ugly old woman and dates to 1685. This type was used for priming and painting as well, but uh, the canvas would have to be restretched to a regular strainer mentioned before when finished. At this point, the chapter would normally continue by talking about specifications on canvases used back in the day, the methods of attaching them to the strainer and so forth, but that would become a huge detour, so we shall skip that to, for the purposes of this project. Now onto a very important, although nowadays pretty much neglected part, the ground layer. What you can find most often in your art supply store is a already stretched canvas primed with white or black color. The ones used in the past differed not only in color, but also in layers. Some artists would, for example, use two layers of different colors type of priming, like Rembrandt or Czech artist Peter Brando, for example. The choice of color or rather pigments used for the ground layer was bound with the subject to be painted or the painting technique itself. In Baroque, they would often use bold ground, which varied from red, red-brown to brown colors. The preparation of such ground layer mixture, or shortly gesso, required chalk, animal skin height and pigments of choice. Mixture was to be properly ground in mortar with a pestle, then applied with a special knife, as you can see in this page from a historical manuscript and its realistic depiction next. I shall skip the details or recipes for now, as it most likely be included in the videos to come. So let's take a simple look at a stratigraphy of a painting on canvas. We have the stretching frame. Canvas, attached to it with tacks, isolation layer from animal height, ground layer, paint layer, and final varnish. However, a paint layer may often be a bit more complex. In some paintings, although it cannot always be seen, what follows on a primed canvas is under drawing, done with a brush and diluted color, sometimes ink, charcoal, and so on. 
a sketch to determine the composition or to define the subject with simplified lines. Then we have underpainting, which was quite often present in Baroque paintings, and its purpose was basic modulation, often monochromatic or in subdued colors. Now the most significant part, the main paint layer, which brings the piece near its completion, and finally the glazing. Distribution of materials, or rather colors, on the canvas creates the difference in stratigraphy. This is why a painting which has traditionally been seen as 2D cannot be viewed as such when restoring it. Painting is not flat. Damage to a painting can vary from a simple scratch to a loss in the paint layer or a loss in both paint and ground layer, which creates a distinction in whether just retouching is sufficient or filling in and potentially modulation is necessary. The further variation is then created whether it's foreground with heavier impastos or more thinly painted background. Now back to our painting. This is what the described phenomenon looks like in reality. Thanks to the most of the background consisting of brownish pigments which were painted in a thin layer and most of the damage limited to a paint layer loss only with ground layer intact, there was no need to fill in as much as opposed to the face and body part of the painting. Before rinsing of the fillings and its final adjusting, I prefer to stretch the canvas. So just a few camera shots to quickly go through. If you recall, the painting arrived without a stretcher, so we had a new one custom made. It is often that edges of a painting are prone or, and more often than not, already carry some ground layer loss or cracking. We have consolidated this painting as a whole, but the restretching caused some parts coming loose. So using a heated spatula, as the consolidant used is heat activated, we managed to avoid the loose parts becoming completely lost. Some more putty around the edges, as doing this before stretching would cause in an undesired cracking. Finally, rinsing and structural adjustment of the fillings, using a cotton swab dipped in distilled water. And now enjoy the gradual disappearance of the damage and the painting coming together as a whole.
Thank you for watching and have a good one.